All right. So first thing, just a couple business points. Uh, one, I have not had a chance to look over the homework that was due uh, yesterday yet. The one that if you need an extension, you got. So uh, I'm going to be going over those in class on Thursday. So um, just make sure you've done it all. And we will cover that on Thursday. Uh, you will have a homework due next Monday. And then next Thursday is the midterm. The midterm is just going to be take home, which I guess is everything we do in this class right now. Uh, basically, what that means, practically speaking, is Arsh, question? Uh, yeah, my last week's homework, did you like send it? Like, so did if I did it, um, if I failed to send it back to you, shoot me an email and I may have forgotten to send it. So just shoot me an email and just be like, hey, okay, you didn't thank you. Yeah. Um, and if just to play it safe, just copy uh, or just attach another copy of it just in case I missed it the first time, but I won't take off any points or anything. Um, all right. Uh, so the midterms next Thursday, I'm going to assign it next Thursday, and then I'm probably going to give you till the following Tuesday to go over or to like turn it in um, just by like class time Tuesday. Uh, so yeah, it's not going to be anything you haven't seen. All the problems that are on it are going to be similar to the problems from one of the homeworks. Uh, and we're going to review what might be on the midterm on Tuesday. So uh, do not worry too much about the midterm. It was originally supposed to be in class and I never, uh, and now it's online or at home. And so because of that, it's not going to get much harder than it would have been if we'd done it in person. And in-person exams, you can never have quite as hard because, you know, you can't look at the book for it. So I don't anticipate it being very difficult. Uh, but still, definitely, you're going to want to study for it. Just not worth stressing out about it too much. Any questions thus far on anything? And again, as I just told Arsh, if you uh, turned in a homework assignment, other than the most recent one and haven't gotten it back, just send me another copy of it and I will get it back to you. Um, and again, this recording will be going up tomorrow morning. So any questions, comments, concerns, feelings at this point? No word on what we're, when we're going back. So uh, there's a, from what I gathered, if you did not turn in your vaccination stuff, you have been removed from classes. Uh, this is something that just happens way above my head. And once the people who are not vaccinated or don't have like whatever legitimate, be it health or religious or something like that, uh, if they are, as soon as they are officially removed, I should be able to get permission to go back to in person. Next week is just gonna be Tuesday. We go over in prep of the midterm and then Thursday, we're not actually gonna have any class. Um, I might just open up the Zoom in case anyone has any questions on the midterm, but we're not actually gonna meet in any serious sense. So we are not going to be doing any sort of in-person next week, but there's a chance the week after, depending on when I hear from the Dean's office what the situation is with the vaccinations. Thank you. Yeah. So as of now, we have no official back, but there's a chance that the week after next, we will be back to meeting in person. Then I just have to find what actual room we meet in because uh, I just found the nice room that's door happened to be open. So I need to actually look and see what our classroom is. But um, anyway, any other questions, comments, concerns, feelings on any of that business stuff? All right. So today's topic is fallacies. How many people have heard of a fallacy before or know what a fallacy is? I've heard the term before, but I just am like drawing a blank. Yeah, that's totally fine. I'm just, I'm mostly curious. Does anyone who's familiar with it want to say what it is? Otherwise I can define it. It's no, no pressure one way or the other. Uh, uh, I was going to say, um, I guess the best way to define it is something, I guess a reason with like a false premise or. Yeah, so it's the best way. There's not really a, like enough. There's not a good definition for anything, but um, the general idea is that it's a type of argument in which it's basically, it's a type of non-valid argument or a type of reasoning that is going to, even if the premise is true, is not going to guarantee a good conclusion. So Olivia says something false, and it's not quite something false. It's more a way of reasoning that is very likely to get you a false answer. 
It's a way of reasoning. And usually the reason why we talk about fallacies is very often they look a lot like good ways of reasoning, valid arguments, but they're actually problematic, invalid arguments that kind of go incognito or in disguise to look like good, valid arguments. So what I'm going to do this class, next class, is just talk about, um, today we're talking about five fallacies. Next time, I think we'll talk about five more. And we're just going to talk about what they are, why they're so problematic, some examples of them, and then why they can still seem so appealing by looking at some things that are good reasons or good ways of reasoning, valid ways of reasoning that look a lot like the fallacies. And the idea of talking about the fallacies is in the same way that we talked about something like modus ponens, so that you can know anytime you see an argument that falls into the form modus ponens, you know, oh, that's a valid argument. If somebody's using this, I can know they're reasoning well. With fallacies, you can now be on the lookout for instances of fallacies in your everyday life and know, oh, this person is using a fallacy or their reasoning is fallacious. Therefore, I shouldn't accept their conclusion. So does all that make sense about how this fits in, what the point of fallacies are, yada, yada? Or why, what's the point of talking about fallacies? So right. you mean the, the reasoning will get you to a false conclusion? It's not necessarily a false conclusion, but remember when it's a valid reason, line of reasoning, it's guaranteed to get you a true conclusion as long as the premises are good. So with a fallacy, it's not guaranteed to get you to the wrong conclusion, but it's going to get you to the wrong conclusion quite a lot, and therefore you shouldn't trust it. So it's more a matter of it's going to be false a high enough percentage of the time that you don't want to reason in this way. And if someone's trying to convince you in the, that way, you shouldn't listen to them. So the, okay, thank you. so the first one we're going to talk about is an appeal to authority. And then we're going to contrast that with appeal to expertise or appeal to experts. So let's start off. What is an authority? And I mean this in the most general, flat-footed way possible. Not a trick question. Just what does it mean to be an authority or to be an authority figure? Have power over people? Yep. Yeah, it's power. And a good example of this is the feds, the people who are in charge. So basically, um, an authority figure is any sort of figure that just has like temporal worldly power over you. And that power comes from whatever systems are in place that give you power. So for instance, <laughs> Triple H. Yeah. So basically any sort of thing that has power is an authority figure. So cops, the government, your parents are authority figures. Um, it, so back to what a fallacy is. A fallacy is a, just a way of reasoning that is guaranteed, not guaranteed to get you a good answer. Basically, the way to think of it is it's a bad line of reasoning. It is a way of going from premises to conclusions that is almost very likely going to get you a false conclusion. So it's not just a single statement. It's a line of statements or an argument that is bad. So what would an appeal to an authority be? If an authority is someone with power, what is it to appeal to something? Anyone know? Or if you go to the court of appeals, what are you doing? You like question the authority? No, so I, I don't know. You're, you're not calling them into question necessarily. What you're doing is you're asking the authority or asking them for their opinion on it. So you're basically, hey, authority figure, what do you think on it? So an appeal to authority argument is one in which you reach your conclusion simply because an authority figure tells you that it's true. So an example of an appeal to authority would be something with the premise. Um, the president says uh, uh, the president says that everything is fine. Conclusion, so everything is fine. This right here, this whole thing is the appeal to authority fallacy. And as you can see, you're not guaranteed to be wrong. Like the president might be right. It might be the case that everything is fine. 
But simply because the president says everything is fine does not necessarily mean that everything is fine. Can anyone think of some other examples of appeal to authority arguments or instances in which someone appeals to authority and they shouldn't? Or they use the fact that an authority figure says something to justify a conclusion and drawing that conclusion is the wrong thing to draw. A situation with like your boss at work or something? Yeah, so if your boss at work tells you, um, so for instance, if your boss tells you something like, you know, well, you've got to live in Manhattan, that's the place you've got to live. Anyone who doesn't live in Manhattan is, you know, they're just a twerp. Well, what is your boss? Why does, are they an authority on where you should live? They don't know what you, you like, where your friends live, things like that. So the simple fact that it's your boss giving you this sort of information is not a reason to believe it. Another one is any sort of celebrity endorsement for something. So they don't necessarily have actual like governmental power, but in a certain sense, celebrities have a lot of authority to sway the public opinion and to sway your views of things like fashion or things like what's cool. So when a celebrity endorses a product, the very fact that the celebrity is endorsing it does not mean that that's a good product. So for instance, if in a commercial, an NBA player tells you that State Farm is the best insurance company, that doesn't mean that State Farm is necessarily the best insurance company. That NBA player is in no way, even if they are like a cultural authority, in no way does that mean they know anything about insurance. Does that make sense to everyone? about what this idea of an appeal to authority is. Yes. Yeah. Now, the reason that, why is it that appeal to authority arguments are so popular? There's a few things that go into it, some of which we'll be talking about later, but why is it that we are so often willing to accept something just because an authority figure says it? So for instance, when um, Trump said that maybe drinking bleach will cure coronavirus, why were there some people who went out and drunk bleach? Why would they listen? Because what is it about, say that again, Lauren? He's like the president of the country. So you would think that he wouldn't try to mislead people because he has taken on that responsibility. So by turning to someone that you think would know better is like a, a reason why you would do that. And very often, what does the president of the United States have access to that you and I don't have access to? So nuclear much information. Codes. Information, the nuclear codes, an entire team of people who are going to give them information. So very often, a person in a position of power will also, in addition to having authority, have expertise. So what is expertise? What is it to be an expert in something? Someone who is like extremely knowledgeable, has wisdom, has experience in it. Yeah, you have experience, you have knowledge, you have wisdom. So if you are an expert in something, you are somebody who, you are someone you sh other people should ask for their opinion on something. So for instance, if your toilet stops flushing, who are you going to ask about what to do about it? A plumber. A plumber. A plumber. You could ask a plumber. You might ask your super if the super is competent. Any people. And why? Because this person is an expert in that topic. And we really, as a matter of fact, as human beings, really rely on expertise because the world is complicated and we can't know everything. So, for instance, if you get sick, you ask a doctor. If you need legal advice, you ask a lawyer. If you need cooking advice, you ask a chef or someone you know is good at cooking. So that is a good way of gaining new information. If someone is genuinely an expert in something, then asking for their opinion or their help is a good way to reach a new conclusion. So if you have something like this, where you have, um, let's say, uh, even say that again. You know um, uh, how Trump was saying one thing, but Dr. Fauci was saying like the other thing. So, so like, and you know, relying on the doctor's opinion on something about a disease is better than relying on the president's opinion. Yeah, so my, my doctor said I 
have high blood pressure. Conclusion, so I have high blood pressure. And in this case, this looks a lot like an authority case because it is somebody else who has some authority in the world. And it's especially true if it's someone like Fauci who also has a government position, where if you listen to someone who has actual expertise on a topic about that topic, then this is a good way of reasoning. So the reason why people were tempted to listen to Trump is because the thought is, Trump is the president who has not access to a lot of doctors and information. So if he says it, he should be an expert on it. But in truth, he was not. The people you have to listen to are the people who actually have the experience and expertise. So when you're asking yourself, should, and this is really just something you should ask yourself anytime you're trying to gain information from a certain source, is you have to ask yourself, is the person who's giving this endorsement or the person who's saying that something's true, are they the sort of expert who would actually know if that's true? So for instance, I would not trust an NBA player to tell me about what the best insurance is, but they are an expert about things like how to shoot a basketball. So if an NBA player happened to walk by the park and tell me how to shoot a basketball, I'd listen to them because they're an expert. So this is why appeals to authority are so tempting because very often, and it's even more tempting when someone has the has become an authority figure because of the expertise they have. So someone like Fauci is an authority figure, but we're not appealing to his doctoral knowledge simply because he has authority. It's rather that we're appealing to his doctoral knowledge because he's an expert. We trust, it's good to trust someone who's an expert about the thing they're an expert in. You don't wanna simply trust someone simply because they have power. It's only if they have power because they're an expert, and then you have to ask them and get information from them about the, whatever it is that they're an expert in. And so the tough thing these days with the internet is to identify who is an actual expert and who's just an authority figure or someone who just has a large online following. So long story short, Appeals to experts and appeals to expertise are necessary and very important if we're going to get around in the world. However, we need to make sure that in the process of trying to appeal to experts, we're not simply appealing to people who have power just because they have power. That's how you end up drinking bleach. If you follow the experts, you're not going to drink bleach. If you listen to someone who just has authority, you might end up drinking bleach. Does that all make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So the fallacy is to just appeal to an authority figure because they're an authority figure. So always, if, if I were to give you an, an assignment that says like, is this an example? And this is going to be one of the assignments for next Tuesday is, is this a fallacy or not? And it's you appealing to somebody, you have to ask yourself, is the person that's being appealed to, are they someone who would actually be an expert on the topic? Or is this just someone who happens to have power? All right, the second one is straw man. So to get the straw man, let's talk about what an objection is. What is an objection? And I mean this, again, not trying to be a trick question. What is it to object to someone's argument or what is it to have an objection to an argument or to someone's conclusion? It's to disagree with them, but it's not just to disagree because there are many ways of disagreeing. Gotti, what did you want to say? Uh, I was going to say like a counter argument kind of. Yeah, so it's objecting to them by giving an argument of your own. So for instance, if you and I disagree, there are multiple ways I could solve our disagreement. What are some of the ways I could try to convince you that I'm right? Give you your reasons for why you I think you're you, right. I could give you reasons, but say I don't wanna give you reasons. What are some other ways I could get you to do what I want you to do? You disprove that theory. So again, that's a disapproval. You're all being very nice, kind people, giving lots of good examples of how you would do this in a rational kind. Manipulate, maybe? Manipulate, Say that again. Manipulate, maybe? Manipulate, threaten. Another one is I could just hit you with a stick until you came around to my way of seeing things. Those things, the hitting, the manipulating, the physical assault, blackmail, those are not objections. 
Objections are you're trying to show that somebody's wrong using your own reasons. So really what you're doing is you're either saying your argument you gave is flawed or here is a different argument. So just to give like a silly example, if I try to convince you that, you know, Monday is the best day of the week, then you are going to object to that. And what might you say in response? Actually, Tuesday is the best day of the week. Yeah, you might say Tuesday is the best day of the week. And you might also say, I might say something like, Monday's the best day of the week because it's the day you're the sleepiest and most miserable. And I like seeing everyone's sad faces. You might say something like, that's not a good reason. You're not actually happy on that day. You're, I've seen you on a Monday, you're miserable. So all of that, that's just giving an objection to what my position is. That is a very good, normal way of reasoning. Now, so that is a normal back and forth. And so that is a good way of doing something. You're giving an actual objection to a position I actually have. Now, what is a straw man? And by this, I mean this in the most uh, like literal sense possible, what is a straw man and what is the purpose of one? So for instance, where have you seen a straw person? Like a referee? Okay, you both spoke, so I uh, didn't quite get it. I said like a referee in a way. A referee? Like, yeah, like, isn't it like that third person that kind of says you are right? Like if I'm hearing like oh. my one gotcha. part of the no, argument that's and a, um, so that is like a uh that's a, a middleman or a uh like an outside arbiter i'm going much more simple i mean quite literally someone made out of straw where would yeah, you like, find a person made out of straw like a scarecrow like a scarecrow one? exactly and what is the point of a scarecrow it's in the name what is the scarecrow there to do to scare crows scare crows away so the point of a scarecrow or a straw man is it's something that's not a human, but from a distance, if you squint hard enough, is going to look like a human. And what, so what a straw man argument is, is it's not an objection to someone's actual view. It is rather an objection to something where if you squint hard enough and aren't careful, you can confuse it with what somebody else has actually said. So to give a, uh, like a, a concrete example, there's a lot of straw men arguments thrown around in the case of the pro-choice, pro-life debate. So you will sometimes hear an extreme case in which somebody who's pro-life says something like, you shouldn't be pro-choice because people, who, anyone who's pro-choice loves it when babies die. So I'm not going to get into the details of the actual abortion debate, but what I think everyone can agree about, no matter what side of the argument they're on, is that there's not actually anybody engaging in the debate who likes it when babies die. So if somebody is accusing the other side of wanting babies to die and objecting to that, that's objecting to a straw man version of the argument. You have replaced what somebody's actually said with something much simpler. You've kind of taken a lazy response to their argument. So instead of arguing against what they actually say, you argue against something that kind of looks like what they say, show that that's wrong, and then claim that the point they actually made was incorrect as well. But you, you kind of do this bait and switch thing. So does that make sense, this idea of what a straw man is? It's objecting to someone by arguing against a caricatured or simplistic version of what they actually said. Got it. Yeah, like kind of like, kind of intentionally boiling their argument down to something that it wasn't actually to make it like easier to rebuttal. Exactly. That's a, that's a better definition than I just gave. Yeah. You boil down someone's actual real substantive good argument into something simplistic, and then you argue against the simplistic version to show that you're right. And so when you do use a straw man, you haven't actually disproved what the person said. What you've disproved is something that someone who's not paying attention won't notice is different. So you see these in politics a lot. You hear somebody uh, who will say, um, somebody has a tax plan that is going to increase taxes for like a certain population. So like you say, there's been an increased tax on 1% of the population. Then the response to that that you might hear in the, 
in a political debate is this person wants to raise taxes. You don't want to lose money. Therefore, you shouldn't vote for them. When really what they're saying is a tax on the wealthiest 1%. You individually would actually pay less. But their political opponent is going to straw man their version of the argument and say, actually, this person believes that we should have more taxes for everybody. That wasn't their position. But by straw manning what they actually said into something simpler, you're able to disprove them or at least convince others that you're right more easily. Anyone have any other examples of straw people arguments that they would want to share or any questions about this idea of a straw man argument? Can you give another example? I'm sorry. Yeah, another example would be something like, um, <clears throat> just to go with another like debate, another one in which a similar one to the abortion one is uh, you could say something like gun control. You could say the reason, like you can imagine somebody, whatever side of the debate you're on, um, there people make arguments that are reasoned on both sides. But if someone were to say something like, uh, if you are anti-gun control, you think everyone should have a gun. And my 95-year-old grandmother would shoot herself if she had a gun. So therefore, gun control is necessary. And if you're pro-gun, you're crazy. That would be a straw man. Say what you will about pro-guns, anti-guns, pro-gun control, anti-gun control. Nobody thinks that if guns are kept legal, everybody needs to have a gun. Like it's a, supposed to be a personal choice. So if you argue for gun control by saying that the opponents think everyone needs a gun and that's crazy, therefore they're wrong, that's a straw man argument. Now, that's not to say that there shouldn't be gun control. It's just saying that if you were to argue for it by claiming that the other side wants everyone to own a gun, and that's crazy because children would have guns and they'll shoot themselves, that's not an argument against the arguments that people actually give for gun licenses to be allowed. That one makes sense, Nat? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions on straw man? All right. False dilemma versus disjunctive syllogism. So what was disjunctive syllogism? Anyone remember, this was in our type of valid argument week where we had modus ponens and some others. And one of them was disjunctive syllogism. Anyone remember what disjunctive syllogism was? It was three lines. And the last one was B, conclusion. Premise two, premise one. Is it um, A or B, not A, B? Is that right? Or yeah. is that, am I- Exactly, yeah. nope, you got, it. you got it perfectly, Lauren. A or B, not A, therefore B. We said this was a valid form of argument and it still is a valid form of argument. However, sometimes what people will do is attempt to impose this form of argument on a case in which it doesn't apply. So let me give you an invalid argument that looks a lot like disjunctive syllogism, but isn't. One, you either love me or dis despise me. Two, I know you don't love me, conclusion, so you despise me. If I were to, to use this argument to come to the conclusion that someone despises me, why is that a bad argument? Why, what is the flaw in this line of reasoning? Well, they're pretty like one or the other. Like there is a huge gap between the two. Like level yeah. of despise, that's like huge difference. This issue is with number one. It's not true that you either love someone or despise someone. There's a huge amount of things in between. You can like someone somewhat, you can be completely ambivalent, you can find them mildly annoying but think they're kind of charming anyway. All of these fall in between. So what a false dilemma is, is you set up 
and you give someone two choices when in truth, there are many different options. So another one is, um, these are often used in politics to try to convince people that one position is better. And the way you do this is you, buy, you give people two options when really there are thousands of options or many options. And you say, here are your only two choices and this choice sucks, so my choice might, must be better. So an example of this would be something like when, um, an example of this would be something like when somebody comes out and says, you either, uh, you either support the police or you want cops to die. It's like, no, there's a big gray area in between. You can support in some things and not others. You don't necessarily like the fact that you have questions about police practices does not mean you want cops to die. Also, an argument that was given back uh, when the United States invaded Iraq in like 2003, the argument was either you support this war or you want the terrorists to win. Again, there are many things in between. You could not support the war and also at the same time not want the terrorists to win. You you could think that maybe there would be other better ways of going against terror and things like this. Um, another one would be someone who you either want to, you either support the prison system or you want the bad guys on the street. Again, you can want to make changes to the American prison system while also recognizing that some level of incarceration might be necessary. It's not an either or. So what a false dilemma is, is a case in which you give someone two choices, make something look black and white in a situation that's actually very, very gray. A disjunctive syllogism is you tell somebody they have only two choices. You prove to them that one of those choices is bad. And then you say you have to accept the third. And the key difference here is in a genuine disjunctive syllogism, you present someone with two options when there really are only two options. A false dilemma, you present someone with only two options when there are really many, many different options. So whenever you see a disjunction or an either or statement, whenever you hear someone say either this or this, Ask yourself, are those really the only two options? If yes, then a disjunctive syllogism works. If there's really many, many different options, then it's no longer the case. If another example of this would be something like your parents tell you, you either have to be a lawyer or a doctor, and I know you hate bodies, so therefore you're going to have to be a lawyer. I mean, no, you could also be a teacher or a fighter pilot or a fireman or a scientist or any of the other countless jobs, software engineer, salesperson, banker, all of those are other options. So this false dilemma makes sense. Everyone on board with what this is? <clears throat> yes. I have a question though. Yes. The, in, the, in the good, the, I, I don't know how to read it, the, the good way to argue. Yeah. Does that mean that you give more than two options or you do give two options, but these are actually the only options? So either one would be good. So basically for disjunctive syllogism to work, you need to present someone with however many options there actually are. So in an ideal case, a, a dilemma typically means two. So in a false dilemma, it's presenting two options. So that's why I've been focusing on two. But with a disjunctive syllogism, it's good where if there are actually two options, you give them two options. If there are actually three options, like if you have... The option, like you get one of those like tri-colored ice creams and there's strawberry, chocolate, and vanilla. And you say, would you like strawberry, chocolate, or vanilla? And then you say, oh, wait, I forgot you're allergic to strawberry and you hate vanilla. Therefore, you're definitely going to want chocolate. Where as long as you know what the three options are, then that's good. But if you were to go to an ice cream parlor where there's 40 different flavors and you try to come to the conclusion that somebody wants chocolate because they don't like vanilla and they don't like strawberry, but really there's also like cookie dough and 17 other flavors to choose from, then it's a bad way of reasoning. So it's a matter of making sure that you consider all of the options that are there. However many that may be in a given case. Okay, got it. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. Uh, 
ad hominem argument. Has anyone ever heard this phrase ad hominem? No. I feel like I have. So let's let's just, I mean, we're gonna we're not gonna use the whole class period, so let's geek out a little bit. Um, hom. Does this this three things, same three letters as what's Homo sapien? Yeah, it's Latin. What is a Homo sapien? Anyone know what that Latin word is? Uh, it's a Latin word for certain species. Human? Yeah, us. humans. Yeah, it's us. So this hom or this hope, this hom is the same hom that's in Homo sapiens, and Homo sapiens is about humans. So if you're giving an ad hominem argument, can anyone guess what the argument is? You're not attacking a position, but you're attacking a A human? I guess the person. Yeah, you're attacking the person. You're attacking their character, their characteristics. So if I'm giving you a long argument, say, about uh, why you should invest your money with one company instead of another, and you turn to your friend and say, that person is has a terrible fashion sense. Therefore, we shouldn't put our money in their mutual fund. Or to give a more concrete example, if you say like, I'm not going to listen to that professor. They have stupid shoes on. Therefore, they can't possibly be telling the truth. That's an ad hominem argument. Or another one would be if you're up in a presidential debate and instead of engaging on tax issues, you just start name calling. That's an ad hominem argument. You say something like, well, they say this is the case, but they're smelly. So therefore, you shouldn't listen to them. Or they're small. So you shouldn't, they're too short. You shouldn't listen to them. Or you're a poopy head. So I'm not going to listen to you. Children are very good at ad hominem arguments. Anytime a kid, instead, you tell them to do something and they just tell you, but you're stupid, mommy, then that's a case in which it's an ad hominem argument. And the idea is, instead of actually engaging with what the person has to say, like the fact is, a smelly person can be just as right about most things as a not smelly person can. Somebody who has silly glasses is going to be just as good at explaining things as someone without silly glasses is. So the point of an ad hominem argument is just because somebody, you don't like someone or you make an attack on their character or their person does not necessarily mean you, should, uh, you shouldn't accept the conclusion they have. The fact that you don't, even the fact that you don't like someone as a person does not necessarily mean, and if you say, I don't like them because they're mean, that doesn't necessarily mean you shouldn't accept what they have to say. They could be correct. They could be very smart and they just happen to be somewhat mean. So does that idea of an ad hominem make sense? Yes. Yes. All right. Now, why is it that we're drawn to ad hominem arguments? What is it there for? If we know looking at them straight ahead that ad hominem arguments are bad, what is it that is so appealing? Why do people give them? Why do we even fall prey to them and find them somewhat convincing at times? They look a lot like, like something else. Wait, say that again. That's how I talked over you. Like it, it discards the the person. Like when you when you question their credibility in some sort, then yes. they're, what they're so saying. So in a lot of cases, it is okay to attack someone as long as what you're attacking them on is directly relevant to what's at issue. It is appropriate to attack someone's credibility on the very thing that you're currently discussing. So for instance, that your math teacher is smelly is not a good reason not to listen to them when they're talking about math. However, if your philosophy professor is very smelly, there are certain areas where the fact that your philosophy professor is smelly is a reason not to listen to them. So what things, because your philosophy professor is smelly, means that you shouldn't listen to your philosophy professor? What are some topics where the fact that I'm smelly is relevant and calls into question my credibility? Another way of putting this is, what sort of advice would you not ask a smelly person for? Like what type of deodorant to get? Exactly. There are certain areas where if somebody's smelly, it's relevant. Another one is, your short is not a good attack on someone's intelligence, but if you're bringing up someone's shortness because they're three feet tall and to ride the roller coaster, you have to be four feet, then all of a sudden saying you're short 
is relevant. It's an attack on their credibility as someone who can ride the roller coaster. Or if someone tells you something like, I rode that roller coaster six times, it's the most fun one. And you're like, I don't believe you. You have to be five feet tall to ride that roller coaster and you're only four feet. You didn't ride that roller coaster. That is a way in which you're attacking personal characteristics can be used if they're relevant to the question that's at issue. So the reason that ad hominem arguments can be so compelling is we often assume that if you're attacking the person, that's somehow relevant to what's at issue. But a good um, orator or someone who's good at persuading and they're, they're not interested in the truth, they just want to convince you of something, will be aware of this fact. So why is it that Trump's ad hominem arguments worked so well in the presidential debates? Well, because a lot of people were willing to accept that the fact that he was saying so-and-so was short or so-and-so was slimy proved that they wouldn't be a good politician, when really, in truth, it had nothing to do with it. So that's what an ad hominem is. It's attacking a person. And the reason it's so appealing is because sometimes it's appropriate to attack someone's credibility. If the thing you're discussing is something that the thing you're attacking is relevant to. Does anyone have any other questions on this one or want any more examples or anything? I'm good. Yeah. So just it depends on if it's relevant to the oh, argument again? or not. So it, it just it depends if it's relevant to the argument or not. Exactly. If the thing you're criticizing someone about is relevant to what's at issue, it's an okay thing to bring up. So for instance, if you bring up like if you're criticizing a politician as a politician because of their hair, that's not a good reason to think they're a bad politician. If you're criticizing a hairdresser because of their hair, then maybe it's a much, you might, you know, if somebody, if a hairdresser has a really bad haircut, you probably don't want to necessarily go to that hairdresser because now you're going to start to question, do they actually know what a good haircut looks like? Or are they just not into my style or something like that? So yeah, it's entirely... Whether it's going to be an ad hominem or it's attacking credibility totally depends on what the current issue is. Got it. So in that sense, it's kind of like the difference between authority and expertise, where expertise is focused on an area. And if it is an expert in that area, it's good. If you're just appealing to someone who's an authority figure because they're an authority figure, it's bad. If you're attacking someone's credibility on a particular topic, by pointing out something they've done poorly on that topic, it's good. If you're just attacking someone for attacking them's sake, it's bad. You're not guaranteed to get a good answer if you're just attacking someone. All right, two wrongs make a right. When a small child and his or her friends or their friends, you've got a small kid, uh, say four years old, five years old, six years old, they all do something that they know they're not supposed to do and they get caught. And each one of them goes back to their parents' house and their parents start scolding them. What is the kid's defense often? What is it that a kid will often say as to why it's okay that they did this thing? Someone else made me do it. Either someone else made me do it or everybody was doing it or it's not that bad, they did the bad thing too. Does the fact that all the other kids are doing it mean that what you did is fine? No, no. That's the essence of a two wrongs make a right argument. And I'm just going to give an example of like the clearest one I've thought of in a long time. Um, one of the students in my former class said her 10 year old brother just got a 23 on his math exam. And when his mom was all mad, as you might be, if your child gets a 23 out of 100, his response was, don't be mad at me. Chris got a 17. That right there is the essence of two wrongs make a right. It's attempting to say that some bad thing you did is not bad because somebody over there also did a bad thing. So another example of this would be somebody in like a judge's, you're, if you go into a courtroom and your defense is, your honor, I did steal that car, but I didn't murder somebody like that guy over there did, therefore don't charge me. That's two wrongs make a right. And it's very clearly not a good way of reasoning. But you'll see that people often try to reason in this way. Um, so does what two wrongs make a right is, does that make sense to everyone? Just the basic idea is saying, what I did isn't bad because somebody else did something worse or equally bad. Yes. Yeah, okay. that makes sense. So why is it then, why are we drawn to two wrongs make a right? 
why is it that sometimes we point to things and we say, wait a second, like, why is it that people are, why is it that the kids said something like, but so-and-so did something equally bad? So part of it is groupthink, where there's this idea of if everybody's doing it, it can't be that bad. And we're going to get back to groupthink a little bit later in the semester. But there's something else that goes into it as well, I think. And that the two wrongs make a right can in some ways look like pointing out hypocrisy. Um, and Sachi, we're going to come back to group think when we get to our uh, psychology section. So I don't want to be dismissing you here. I'm just saying we're going to talk about that one a lot more. So I want to save it for that. Um, what is hypocrisy, though? What is a hypocrite? If you say something, but you did this, like to not do something, but then you did it. Yeah. So a hypocrite, there's basically two ways of being a hypocrite. You can either say one thing and say it's opposite. So I can say something like, oh yeah, I, uh, I never, I never lie. And then in my next sentence, lie. I'm being a hypocrite. I say I don't lie and then I'm lying. The other way you can do it is you say you never do something and then you go and do it. So, um, my favorite example that I've heard in a long time, uh, um, how many of you know background? How many people know anything about Hungarian politics and what's going on over there right now? Anybody know what is happening in Hungary politically? All right, long story short, uh, Hungary is having a similar sort of thing to a lot of nations where it's becoming more and more right-wing conservative and they have like a right-wing, very socially conservative uh, demagogue sort of leader right now. And he is, there's been a big move in Hungary to do such things as outlaw homosexuality. And there was a big debate and there was this new law passed uh, outlawing homosexuality on the grounds that it's somehow wrong and morally bad, et cetera. Well, one of the major drivers for this bill, uh, this was in the part of COVID. So across Europe, there were major, uh, major like stay at home orders and there were limits on how many people could be in a place and no public gatherings and anything like that. So at the time that COVID was going on and the week after this anti-homosexual bill had been passed, one of the main leaders of the bill was arrested attempting to flee a gay orgy in Belgium where it was illegal for a large number of people to be gathering together. So we have a case of a politician claiming homosexuality is wrong while at the same time engaging in homosexuality. And that is right there the essence of hypocrisy, saying one thing, doing something else. Why don't we like hypocrites? What is the issue with hypocrisy? There's two potential issues with it. Well, it invalidates someone. Yeah, so the one thing is it invalidates someone. So if someone is saying something genuinely, and they say like, you think they're telling the truth and then they do something else entirely, it suggests that maybe they weren't telling the truth. Maybe they were lying. Either that or they're completely contradicting themselves and not worth listening to because they're an irrational person. If I were to say something like, you know, I really like dogs, but I don't like dogs. Or I really like cats, but I don't like cats. The only thing you can say in response to that is, huh? Or please leave the room. If somebody's being hypocritical, it shows they're either thinking not straight so you don't have to listen to them or they're lying so you don't have to listen to them. So when you point out hypocrisy, it can be very valuable. So if you find out that somebody is saying one thing and doing something else, that can be a case in which you're pointing out a wrong they did to prove a point. So very often the way you point out a hypocrite is you say something that like, oh, you're doing something that by your own lights was wrong. So you point out this, the guy who was arrested at the gay orgy, who was at the same time claiming that homosexuality was evil. You point out by your own lights, you have violated something you have said. You said all gay people should be punished. And then you are going out and doing this. You are contradicting yourself. So that would be a case in which you point out somebody's wrong to prove that they're a hypocrite. That is not the same, however, as two wrongs make a right. When you're pointing out that someone did something wrong or did something that goes against what they say, you're pointing to something that is directly relevant to what they're saying. 
If you're pointing to the person who claims that like, uh, you need to leave a chaste Christian life, but then they're going to sex parties, then that's a sign that this person has done something wrong by their own life and they're a hypocrite and you shouldn't listen to them about morality. If, however, you find out that somebody has done something wrong and the way you justify that wrong is by pointing to some completely other wrong thing, it's not a good way of reasoning. So for instance, if you, um, you know, I've, I've heard people say something along the lines of, you know, American slavery wasn't so bad because at least it wasn't the Holocaust. Like that right there is a terrible argument. The fact that the Holocaust was terrible in no way devaluates, um, in no way invalidates the horribleness of slavery. We have two horrible things. Each are so incredibly horrible. Talking about one in no way makes the other one right. So that is a two wrongs make a right argument. When you talk about, you try to justify one bad thing by just pointing to another bad thing. It is okay when you point out that somebody's contradicting themselves by go, doing something that by their own values is bad or wrong. Does that, does that distinction make sense to everyone? Yes. All right. Are there any questions on any of these five things on either side? I'm sorry, can you just give an example on uh, number two on the similar but good? I just the didn't write an objection to actual position. Yeah, I didn't write um, an example. Oh, so this one would literally just be something where I make a point and then you object to that point with a reasonable argument. So if I say, say, imagine I say something like um, Frankie's pizza is the best. That's what I say. And then you respond with, no, it's not. Their sauce is too sweet. That right there is just a straight up a fair, reasonable, actual objection to my actual position. Now, a straw man version of this would be Frankie's pizza is the best. That's what I say. And you conclude, you're not right. You eat way is the best pizza. You eat way more burgers than pizza. So you don't think pizza is the best, so you're wrong. I never said that pizza is the best food ever and that it's better than burgers. What I said is that Frankie's pizza is the best pizza. If you twist my words and put words into my mouth and say, what you're claiming is pizza is the best food, but you don't even believe that. You think burgers are better. You eat way more of them. So you're wrong. You were lying. That would be a straw man version as opposed to the response of, no, it's not the best pizza. The uh, sauce isn't, or the sauce is too sweet. Does that distinction help a little bit in that? Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right. Are there any more questions on any of our 10 things that we discussed today? All right. In that case, I'm going to stop the recording, tell you all to have a great rest of your night, have a good Wednesday, and I will see everyone on Thursday, same time, same Zoom link.